Yeah, yeah, why didn't we think so? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's 7 a.m. August 11, 2021. We'll call this meeting of the Fergus Falls City Council Committee the whole to order. Roll call, please. Here. 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 We have a quorum. First item uh, up for discussion this morning is uh, the uh, discussion on the Opticom traffic signal project and we'll call on our Chief of Public Safety, Kyle Bergering. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, Mayor, thank you. Um, this morning I'd like to talk about the, uh, that seems really loud. <laughs> this <morning. laughs> Let's push that away a little bit. Um, the Opticon um, traffic control system, it's a preemptive uh, uh, traffic control device. Um, for emergency vehicles uh, very common down in uh, the metropolitan area it's actually a Minnesota uh, it was developed by 3m so it's a Minnesota based company and uh, it's really um, at this point a, a global product it's uh, all over the world um, it's been around for about 40 years so um, we did some checking uh, MnDOT has uh, one uh, signal light that's equipped with a different product uh, in town uh, talking with MnDOT and they've been having a lot of problems with that uh, particular product so in the process of uh, dealing with them and getting that corrected uh, we started looking at what the cost would be to have the rest of our signals uh, in town uh, upfitted with the Opticom system and um, to be quite honest, I thought it was relatively inexpensive um, for for what is provided. And when you look at it from a risk management standpoint, either having a police officer or a firefighter get involved in a traffic accident at an intersection, or obviously a member of the public, um, you know, total cost of about eighty thousand dollars or ninety thousand dollars to do eleven traffic lights. Uh, is relatively inexpensive. I, I would say one traffic collision is going to more than cover uh, that expense. Um, so, um, so the the costs that uh, we're talking about today that just covers the costs of upfitting the the actual traffic lights, and those costs are covered under um, Minnesota state aid. So that's where the money would come from uh, to cover the cost of the signal lights. The second uh, portion of the project would be uh, installing the infrared uh, emitters on the fire trucks and, and police vehicles. Uh, those costs are relatively inexpensive, anywhere from about $500 to $1,000 per unit. And those are something that we just absorb into our normal operating budgets. And we also have some money um, either in the equipment fund or um, our forfeiture fund. So not looking at any action on that. I uh, just wanted to clarify that there are two uh, portions of the project and that uh, the portion that you're taking action on today, those costs would be covered by uh, Minnesota State Aid. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Chief, just to, so this is just a system that when activated that automatically sets the light so that the uh, emergency vehicle can pass through with yeah so um if you go to lincoln avenue and um tower road and if you look up on the arms of the traffic lights the equipment is already installed on that intersection we're not sure if it's operational yet um but there's um to me it looks like the a little steam whistle head uh at the top of the um uh arm with the traffic light on it and then right next to it you'll see a white floodlight so when the uh, emergency vehicle comes up to the intersection it's emitting a infrared light that's detected by that little steam whistle looking thing and a white light will um, a steady white light will show for that intersection uh, the, it signals the traffic control device to go through its sequence it will turn all three legs of the intersection red uh, and it will show a green light for the direction that the emergency vehicle is, is traveling so basically shuts down traffic red lights uh, to all other legs of the intersection gives it free access if it has to make a left turn 
Um, and then once the emergency vehicle uh, travels through the intersection, then the traffic light just goes back through its, its normal sequence. Thanks, Chief. So the action we're looking for today is a recommendation to approve the installation. Of this I, I just have one yeah. question: Could, Can the county sheriff's department, you know, access it and use it the same? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's actually a pretty. Uh, we're looking at probably the the very minimal system. It's a pretty robust system. You can get it in um, a GPS system that can map where you're going and kind of do the lights ahead of. Uh, of you even getting to the intersection. But uh, yeah, the ambulance service, the sheriff's office, uh, I know some of the state patrol vehicles in town are already equipped with it because they travel uh, you know, down to the metro. Uh, this is also kind of consistent with what MnDOT has done. Uh, the city of Moorhead has switched from an old system to this new infrared system. So if we were ever uh, you know, to go on a mutual aid jaunt to Moorhead. I know uh, the fire department already has an agreement in place with Moorhead. All of our vehicles are equipped. They could respond up there to have the same abilities uh, in the city of Moorhead or vice versa if they came down here. Uh, the other one too, I'll just mention, very uh, minimal use, but uh, a possible advantage is snow plowing. Um, not that you would install this on every single snow plow within the city but um, you know probably uh, one of the uh, motor patrols and in, in the sand trucks but as the uh, snow plow is going down the street can trigger the green light so the snow plow doesn't have to stop and it, again just more of an efficient way of, of plowing um, and getting the streets open for the public so lots of different uses for it but I guess today our main focus is really kind of on the public safety piece. Justin, you have a question? Maybe just one minor question. With the saying we're kind of going with the, you know, this baseline version, if we needed to enhance it, I'm assuming it's more like an a la carte where you can do that later, or would it be like a total You You overhaul? can. Um, you know, the so I think I told you about 500 to to $1,000 per unit. Um, for the emitter, if you go to like a GPS system, you're up to about $3,200 per unit. And, you know, in a, in a community our size, it's just not probably feasible. Uh, the other thing the system has that, again, um, we would never use is uh, there's an ability from a centralized control center to, um, as vehicles are responding to scenes, to prioritize vehicles or to um, um, take away their privilege uh, of using um, the Opticom system based on the type of call they're responding to. This, this even at the base system, um, you know, it will give a fire truck or a police car priority over a snowplow, for example. Uh, there's also a conflict uh, management system built in. Uh, so if, if Ryan and I are going to the same call, and we're heading to an intersection on two different streets. Um, if I trip the Opticom first, my side will show that steady white light uh, as well as the green. His will show a blinking white light up there that indicates to him that somebody else is entering that intersection has priority, um, you know, when they enter the intersection. So, um, but like I said, the, just the cost and uh, for the size of our community, I can't see that we're probably ever going to need to to upgrade to a more sophisticated uh, program. It's like it nice to know that we could if we needed. But yes, it yep. doesn't sound like we probably never need that sophisticated yep. of Jim technology. Uh, Jim, you have a question? No, I'd like just going to gonna offer the offer the motion to motion. to the council for I'll approval. I'll second, Someone like to second Justin. Any other questions for the chief? All in favor of the motion to bring this to the council, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Let's, we have our other chief up next with the 2022 Minnesota DNR Volunteer Fire Assistance Matching Grant. Good morning, Chief Muckow. Good morning, Mayor, members of the council, and also thank you for supporting uh, Chief Berger. And it's been a fun project to uh, get to work with him. And then uh, also to see that come through in our city will certainly in, uh, enhance some of our response uh, abilities, even going to the west side through all the 
the intersections we travel. So that'll be that'll be a, a, a neat a neat tool to have for us. Um, what I stand in front of you for is uh, to looking for your approval to accept the uh, 2022 DNR Volunteer Fire Assistance Matching Grant, um, something we applied for, and uh, you know it, it's been about three years since we've received this uh, this uh, last go around. Um, and uh, we're eligible because of the rural areas that we protect. Um, and what we're looking to buy is uh, some hose appliances, gated wise, um, uh, nozzles, and then also a brush guard and winch for one of our wildland trucks that mostly serves the, the rural area. So we think it's a pretty neat deal. The total project cost is about $6,500. And with the DNR grant that, uh, that they're offering us, uh, that would cover half the costs with the remainder coming out of our capital fund for our vehicles. All right. Questions. Okay, two questions for Chief on that. Uh, I'll, I'll make the motion. Motion. motion I'll second it. Council, thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Caroline. All in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Jose, same sign. That motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have an update from the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, and we'll welcome Elizabeth Waple. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Thank you for uh, having me here this morning. Um, it's great to see you all so early, every bright-eyed and bushy-tailed like me. Um, um, as the Mayor said, my name is Elizabeth Wafel, and it is always exciting for me, as I told uh, Council Member Fish, to be in Fergus Falls. It is one of my favorites. So um, I think most of you know, but for those who don't, um, we are a membership organization, and that is actually wrong. We're up to 110 cities, the city of Proctor in northern Minnesota, just joined and we work on issues that um, unite uh, cities across greater Minnesota. Um, LGA and property taxes is probably the biggest thing that we put our energy into but we work on a lot of different things. Economic development, annexation and land use, transportation, my personal favorite, environment and energy, um, that's a lot of wastewater for me, um, and labor and employment. Um, you know this last area that I'll just mention is, is one that has been, you know, we've really significantly increase the work on that over the last couple years and that's something we don't we don't do a, a lot of lobbying we do some lobbying um, you know there are some of the pension issues that we've been stepping up on and lobbying um, but we also provide a lot of services we've been doing tons more webinars and whatnot because of all the issues that have arisen um, due to um, the pandemic but it's also again um, an, ish, an area we've even been doing some Bradley Peterson mainly handles that if you have questions but it's been doing lobbying on that and there's other areas that do pop up for example myself and Julie Liu are going to be doing a conference call with the Attorney General's office tomorrow on the opioid settlement and that impact on greater Minnesota cities um, boy, it's been a year. I'm sure it's been a year for you. It's been a year for all of us. Um, this is the first month in 18 months where there hasn't been a legislative session. I, I don't know for, about you, but for me, that's a big relief. Um, it has been nonstop work, and we've been working not only on our typical legislative issues, but you know, really pushing hard um, last year on things like dealing with federal funding, as well as you know, trying to get that bonding bill that was supposed to be done in May done. Um, and, and so forth. Um, we had thought maybe there would be a little bit of a shift at the Capitol and how things were done, but the election in 2020 saw no change in control. So really it's just been month after month, a special session. Um, and then other issues have popped up we hadn't expected. A year of the pandemic and um, unrest in the Twin Cities meant that police reform and the uh, governor's emergency powers were dominant topics of discussion when things were kind of coming down to the end of budget negotiations. This is actually live pictures of all of uh, four of us main lobbyists testifying this year. And, uh, you know, it really was different legislating. It was, the, you know, the Capitol was closed to the pandemic. I finally got in for the first time in June. The House and Senate office buildings have been closed and they continue to be closed. Um, there's been no in-person committee meetings, few in-person legislator meetings, and lobbying has been done via Zoom, in-person, excuse me, phone calls, texts, and emails. Um, having legislators' cell phones has been a key to sort of be operational effectiveness this year. Um, we've really adapted um, and, uh, you know, d approach things a different way. I, you know, a number of you have been to our legislative action day, you know, um, that we do in the spring, and that's usually our most popular event. Back in 2020, I think that was the last normal event before things went into lockdown. We weren't able to do that this year. We adjusted by doing um, advocacy weeks, which are one week focused on different topics. Um, that was really successful, and what was great about that and what I, we really hope sort of continues 
once the lot, you know, once things actually open up more, is that we were able to meet with legislators in person. For example, I was hosting meetings with six to eight city officials from across the state with different legislators, and that ability of our members to be able to talk to legislators sort of face to face without coming down to the Capitol was really helpful. And then we hope that you know that can continue even when in person is available. Um, you know, we did guest columns, social media campaigns on these different issues, uh, even did an LGA video. Um, our top goals, you know, no surprise to anyone was we didn't want any cuts to LGA. We pushed for a bonding bill, more child care funding, and also pushing on city street fundings. Those are some of the um, the goals. Uh, we, we did obviously work on other things. You should have received via email um, a copy of our report that includes those goals and details. I have paper copies of it and can leave those after the meeting for anyone who wants hard copies. Um, heading into the bu the uh, legislative session, you know, we were a little bit worried about the budget, and with good reason. If you remember back to May 2020, they were predicting a very large budget deficit. By November, that shifted down a little bit, but they were still expecting for the upcoming biennium a $1.2 billion um, budget deficit. And if you've been around at all, you know that that creates worries. And you know, the reason it creates worries is because in the past, when there has been state budget deficits, one of the things they have gone after is LGA, and that is not acceptable. You know, in times of LGA, to we believe that you know it is really fundamental to help you know our city sort of survive and thrive, especially um, you know during the pandemic and going beyond. So we made it a top goal for us to make sure that LGA was paid on time and in full. It was our mantra for the session, and um, we were very aggressive about this. Um, you know, different tactics again. You know, ju not just the lobbying. We even made a uh, like a video commercial for LGA um, really uh, uh, tackled the media aggressively we left nothing to chance I um, mean here you can kind of see this is a just little sna snapshots from our video it's still on the website if you want to see it um, but we were happy to see that the budget forecast did swing up <coughs> And um, by the time we rolled around to February 2021, we were starting to see a budget surplus. Um, and then the second round of federal funding also helped add to that. So that meant that LGA was safe. And in fact, we were able to help pass a one-time appropriation. There were a number of cities. Um, I, this did not affect Fergus Falls, but affected cities like Detroit Lakes, who would have seen a dip in their LGA. So we were able to go to one-time appropriation to hold them harmless. Um, so that was really helpful. For, for those cities. Um, the one thing I will say that it did sort of trigger was discussion about, you know, is it time to look at the LGA formula? You may recall that the last time we um, looked at the formula it was back in 2013. It tends to happen about once a decade, often around um, the, the um, redistricting and census numbers. And uh, the chairs of both the House Property and Senate Property Tax Committees, as well as the regular tax committees, have expressed an interest in looking at that and the one thing one you know we're reassuring all members is that we will be very very actively engaged in any and all LGA discussions it is extremely important we know um, you know how important it is to our cities and we've been actively engaged before on the formula we will continue to do so you know we have an in-house analyst as well as a contract with Jeff Van Wyken you know to make sure that any proposal we run the numbers if there aren't any proposals to change the LGA formula we will put hard to make sure the additional money is um, is there you know uh, the mayor was able to attend our conference two weeks ago in Alexandria and there's a lot of discussion about LGA amongst the property tax chairs um, and even the governor mentioned that they all recognize how important it is to greater Minnesota in fact the governor even mentioned he wanted to see more money put into the program so we will be working on this and keeping it at the forefront of everybody's mind um, child care continues to be an issue and we were able to have some success there you know money was put towards the initiative foundation grant programs towards deed child care um, redevelopment and um, we also helped make sure that some of the federal money was going that way um, again there if you look in that packet we sent that's got a listing more of the, sort of the details of, of this, our successes in that area we spent a lot of time on housing. Um, we were a little disappointed we didn't get more progress there, but that was because a lot of our efforts were aimed at a bonding bill, and there was no bonding bill this year. But again, that will be a top priority for, for next year. Um, for those of you um, who care about uh, broadband, you know th um, that's something that we've, we've helped on through the years. We, we were active really 
early on and then have helped, you know, sort of in the push for money. Um, but we saw the largest contribution um, towards broadband this year that we've seen since the program was created. Now, my favorite topic, uh, wastewater. Um, if you haven't heard of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, you probably will. These are a class of 4,000 chemicals that affect human health, and um, they're really expensive to get out of drinking water. You can ask Bemidji about their experience, but nearly impossible to get out of wastewater. Um, so we've been working on a lot of things. It's been taking up a lot of my time, but we were successful in passing through some legislation aimed at how do we keep PFAS out of wastewater, and um, we got that funded. It's an initiative to study and help cities keep PFAS out of their wastewater. We also spent a lot of time on defensive lobbying. There was some legislation that would have created some significant problems for cities in terms of legal liability. We were able to push back on that, and that's something I'll probably be engaged on over the next couple of years. Um, a couple other um, environmental areas we worked on, putting more money towards chloride grants for those. A lot of our cities are facing that in their wastewater um, permits, so we're trying to get money to help uh, deal with the softener issue there. The point source program, um, helping get money there from the Clean Water Fund. And there's honestly a host of other issues, but I know that probably at 7 in the morning you don't want to spend that much time on wastewater, so I would direct you again um, to the packet because we've got a, you know, a two-sided, one-page handout on all the work we've been doing on environmental issues. Um, bonding, um, you know, 2020 was the bonding year, but, uh, you know, the regular session ended without a bonding bill, so we spent, you know, a lot of time throughout the summer and fall making sure that that got passed because it's important not only for our cities on individual programs, but also on getting money to those sort of bread and butter grant programs, like through the PFA and through the BDPI. Um, we, were, we were happy to see, you know, the largest amount of money we've seen put into uh, water infrastructure, money towards those other um, greater Minnesota priorities. We were hoping to get a 2021 bonding bill done. You know, we thought it made a lot of good sense trying to come out of the pandemic to do spending on those infrastructure programs. Unfortunately, I think sometimes when you have a big package like we had in October, there's a little bit of a, you know, like, oh, didn't we just do this feeling amongst the legislature? And so, um, you know, we were actively engaged on that. A lot of advocacy. We had bills pushed forward, but it just, it, it didn't click on. The, um, the House did come forward with a bonding bill that I'll be honest, we immediately panned. Um, it was one that was a large bonding bill, but primarily focused on the metro area. Um, and uh, the Senate expressed interest, but they didn't get anything done. There's discussions about a bonding bill in September. Um, I'll be honest, I don't think it's going to happen. If it is, we'll be pushing on our programs, but otherwise we'll focus on doing that for the upcoming 2022 legislative session because we know how important that is to our communities. Um, looking ahead, you know, we're already starting to lay the groundwork, as I mentioned. Like, like I mentioned, LGA will be a primary focus. We've got a great a team on there, you know, uh, Bradley, Anya, uh, Jeff Van Wyck, and, uh, and others from our office working hard on LGA. Um, bonding will also be a top priority. And then redistricting is something we'll be watching. That's on the horizon. And, um, you know, we'll also be watching what happens, you know, and how, how uh, the legislature is going to look. This is one of those years where not only is the governor's race up, but every single legislative seat will be open. And, you know, that tends to affect legislative behavior, um, and for good or bad. But we'll be watching that. We'll be making sure that they all have the interests of greater Minnesota in mind. Upcoming events. Oops, sorry, forgot to change the slide. We had a great uh, conference in Alexandria. Thank you, Mayor, for uh, for joining us for that. Um, next event is our fall conference in Wilmer, and then our probably our most popular event is the Legislative Action Day. Um, in St. Paul. Um, next summer, our uh, conference will be in Red Wing, and if you haven't spent any time there, it is another gorgeous city on a river, and I strongly encourage you to, to look towards that one. That's at the end of July. I want a big thank you to Fergus Falls. Um, Fergus, you know, we're up to 110 members, but, you know, Fergus Falls has been there early on and has been a longtime active member of the organization. We've accomplished a lot through the years, and the, the reason we've been able to do that is because we have such a diverse and active membership throughout the state. We really appreciate the important role Fergus Falls has played on that, and I want to encourage each and every one of you, if you're not on a committee yet, we are always looking for more members. Um, I handle both environment and the annexation committees, and I'm always excited when more people want to get engaged, but our other committee members would say the same thing. You can contact me or anyone on the staff if you have questions or if you want to get involved. But thank you. 
And is there any questions I can answer? Anyone have any questions for Elizabeth? Scott? Uh, going to one of the items that you identified as one of your uh, pet pe pet areas. Yes. That PFAS you said it was difficult to remove from wastewater. Yes. What's the risk? So, what if there's PFAS in the water? What is the what is the problem with that? Um, that it has been increasing. Uh, they've increasingly shown, um, from a scientific standpoint, that it causes health harms. Um, Particular, you know. Uh, you're seeing this actually over in the um, the metropolitan <laughs> suburbs. Um, there's uh, cancer risks, risks to pregnant mothers, and so forth. And they're finding that it it. I, I try to walk a line here because I don't want to scare people, but it is the the um, particularly with the older, longer chain PFAS. They are finding that it is even in small quantities can be harmful to human health, and it's something that you just don't you don't want in your drinking water. Do we know where it comes from? Uh, yes, we do. It's uh, it is a manufactured chemical, and it's you know it's one of those things where it can be very helpful. It is you know it's what keeps it what makes your you know your Teflon pants nonstick, and it is what keeps your you know the rain off your Gore-Tex jackets. And um, it's a large class of chemicals. It's you know it's fine. It was predominant in firefighting foam. They've actually pulled it out of a lot of the foams because of the health risks. Um, and so the challenge really with that is. Um, again, because of different processes, you can remove it, but it's very expensive once it gets into the drinking water. Um, Bemidji, for example, um, because their firefighting training um, center was located at their airport and it was right above their drinking water wells, it seeped into their water. So they're having to do a new treatment plant to pull it out of their drinking water. Um, and you're seeing over in the eastern metro, that was basically where it was being manufactured. It seeped into their water supply, and they've been having even more challenges over there so they're you know working on that so for us our approach on a wastewater standpoint because we don't want to put obviously we want to deal with the drinking water problem we don't want that affecting our citizens on that end but on the wastewater facility end you know again it's challenging so we're really focused on source reduction and trying to identify how is it getting in there and um, that was the, the purpose of our source reduction strategy was to again you know, pull together a team so that we, you know, we, like the CGMC itself won't be doing the work. We'll be, you know, the, we'll be on a task force led by the MPCA looking at what are some of the main sources that are getting into wastewater. For example, we know that there are certain types of businesses that use um, PFAS in their, in their, in their, uh, their business or in their like their manufacturing processes so it's trying to work with them to make sure it's not getting diverted into the wastewater stream um, and um, or looking for alternative um, products but um, it is at the end of the day it's trying to prevent those health risks of getting it into drinking water and just to clarify the work of the coalition sometimes then MPCA has come down with some rules and regulations that have been very difficult on city budgets to deal with these things so it's trying to create partnerships with the state so that the cities are able to deal with these things in a way that doesn't crush their budgets basically is that accurate that is very accurate <laughs> if, if this stuff is that bad why is it still being used that's a very large philosophical question <laughs> um, <laughs> you know i think that um so what I you know I, I think part of it is you know boy that that gets into some of those sort of like how do we regulate uh, chemicals in this country is that we tend not to when you introduce new chemicals into processes, you are not required, you know, unless it's going into a drug that requires, like, say, FDA approval. There's no, there's no sort of pre-approval requirements on things. And so, um, once we find things out, they'll make changes. Um, boy, I'm going to get in the weeds here, but with the PFAS, you know, originally when they started manufacturing, they were what was called longer chain PFAS. And so, after a number of years, they discovered that it had health. Um, health risks. So they started manufacturing different types of that to try and get rid of the more harmful ones. But they're finding more and more that these are, you know, can be harmful in, in at lower levels. Um, but it's just the, the way our regulatory scheme is set up in this country is we don't we don't pre-approve chemicals before they're they're used. But yes, the, and I do want to say the mayor is right, is that part of our problem is is that we, I mean, we're seeing this and we're seeing in other states, we're seeing regulations coming down on cities. And, you know, right now, literally the technology is not there for you to install something to deal with all of these at your wastewater facility. But, you know, our worry is, is that 
if there were, again, that really hits your budget. It's like, like it's worth seeing cities get hit with chloride stuff. Um, so to us, it's really important to focus on how do we keep it out. I and mean, it's the same thing like we're doing with chloride, we're doing with other, other types of chemicals, because if you have to deal with those, it becomes very expensive and it hits your budget, taking away from things that you want to be spending money on. Just one, 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 one quick question. Yeah, when do you, what's the timeline on replacing Laura Bishop? Um, good question. Uh, so uh, she, uh, um, so right now Peter Tester, who you know was, was the deputy, is in is the assistant commissioner. So um, they just released last week um, uh, an announcement saying that they're accepting applications. So if any of you have an interest in becoming the MPCA commissioner, now is your time to shine. Um, but um, you know, some of us thought that honestly, I thought the governor was going to just go with the deputy until the. The election, but it looks like they are going to be replacing her. Um, you know, boy, if you look at you know the other ones who have been replaced, it's taken about three three to four months. So I would anticipate we will see a new commissioner probably before the legislative session starts. You know, they're accepting applications; got to go through the whole process. Um, you know, it's it will be more challenging this time. I think you know there's been an interest, particularly in those positions, and getting people who have corporate experience. But after what happened to Laura Bishop, I think you know a lot of folks are going to be like, I don't know if I want to take that risk. So we could see the deputy be continued until the next election. Great. Thanks. Any other questions for Elizabeth? Well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks for the work that the coalition does. I would encourage any staff or council to attend the meeting in Wilmer in November. I think it's a great opportunity to see what the coalition and also mm -hmm. see the uh, you know, see, see colleagues from other cities and talk about some of these issues that are affecting us and how we can deal with them together. So yes. thanks, thanks right. Elizabeth, for all your work. Thank you, Mayor. And like you said, um, I've got some additional reports if anybody needs a paper copy. <coughs> all right. Um, Moving on, we'll look to our community development manager, Clara Beck, to guide us in a discussion on a comprehensive plan. Good morning, Clara. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. All right. Um, my reasoning for being here this morning is twofold. Um, essentially, we are, staff is looking to get directive on the creation of a comprehensive plan. Um, so first, I just wanted to get this on your radar. I think you've all probably heard comprehensive plan over the years um, as an item on city staff's wish list. Um, it remains on our wish list, and I really do think it's something we should focus on creating. Uh, so essentially, what we're looking, looking for this morning is some directive to look into what a comprehensive plan could look like for the city of Fergus Falls. I think we can get kind of creative with it. We have a lot of plans that have already been created. We've got our downtown riverfront master plan. We've got a bike and ped plan that's going to be done soon. Um, on Monday, you'll be hearing the RTC master plan. So we have an opportunity to take all of these different pieces that we've created over the years and put them together and give us sort of an overarching idea of what the priorities are for our city. Um, creating a comprehensive plan gives us the opportunity to kind of step back and look at things from a higher level and engage the community a little bit further in some of the work that we're doing and, and see what their priorities are too. So our directive is, or our question is, are you interested in seeing a comprehensive plan be part of your 2022 budget? And if so, may we do some research and then come back to you with some options? Um, including options for grant opportunities, because there are several out there that would be useful toward creating a comprehensive plan. Thanks, Clara. I, I would just start off the conversation by saying I am in favor of having a comprehensive plan be part of the 2022 planning budget, and I would I would um, ask that the planning commission be involved in that conversation as, as far as um, how that looks and how that's implemented. I know I had conversations with the planning commission, well, six months ago and they you know they just expressed a real desire to have some sort of overarching guideline and, and document that would s so when a developer comes or when someone comes in with a plan and they want to do something in our community we have a, um, a unified you know approach to say hey thank you for coming to our community here's our plan for the future here's let's find out how you fit into this plan rather than I think that uh, we all recognize that if you get it to the planning commission and the council and you get this development, it's like we don't have a vision for exactly what is the overall um, plan for our community. I know these things cost money, 
Uh, but you know the old adage, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail, whatever. Um, I think that successful communities do have plans and visions and that transcend individual councils and staff members. If it's, a, it's a vision for the future that as people come and go, uh, the vision remains the same. And when people come to community and want to invest in your community, you say, thank you. Here's how that fits into our plan. And it's, um, not, an, it's not everything's not on an ad hoc basis, um, trying to make something work. So anyway, I am in support of it. That's my two cents. And I'd look to the um, thoughts of the other council members. I guess just Caroline. to take along with that, with the, you know, how, how do we have different entities, right, that are all working together. We've got the Port Authority that um, can be involved in that. We've got Greater Fergus Falls, and it just kind of gets everyone on the same page. Um, so I guess I would be in support of a comprehensive plan as well. Yeah, particularly at least at least bringing, a, bringing back what that would look like, what it would cost, how that would work. But I think it's yeah. a good point, Caroline, the Port Authority and Greater Fergus Falls. You know, I said the Planning Commission should also definitely – Obviously, city staff should all be involved in that. Sorry, go ahead. I think, I think mine would be that if we're going to do this, we have to get true engagement of people. Um, you know, the last time we did this, um, there was about, I think, 20 to 30 people on the committee, and they felt that, you know, the, the consultants basically went into Gordon's old office, kind of scrubbed down his walls, you know, grabbed a few th a few things, and then they came to the meetings with a preconceived idea of what Fergus Falls should look like, and a lot of the people that were invited to attend that meeting didn't feel they had a voice, and and I think you know the consultants that we use need to come in with with a blank page, and ask the people of Fergus Falls what they want, and and that should and then listen to them, and develop develop something around what the people of Fergus Falls want, not a consultant out of Minneapolis St. Paul because we're not Minneapolis St. Paul. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. Other other thoughts, Justin? I'd maybe just make a comment. I think it's a it's a great idea and I think it's something we should commit to doing. I also think if we're gonna commit to doing the plan, we commit to following through with the plan along with um, reviewing the plan. I think um, a lot of plans fall, we spend money and they, they're on the shelf and, and I'm not saying that would happen, but you know, I think we need, if we're going to commit to doing it, spending money, we need to commit to actually doing the projects that are on the plan, having a timeline, and then reviewing that, um, I don't know, annually. I don't know what would be appropriate, but uh, I'd like to see us move forward with that. I would totally support um, getting some numbers on how we kind of start that process. Because I think, you know, Fergus has done a pretty good job on solo projects, I think. But, you know, then five years later, you look at something and say, I wish we had on this differently, and I think with the plan in place, we might be able to move away from that. Thanks, Justin. Tom? Yeah, I'll just chime in with my support as well. I think um, I think a plan like this is it's going to save work. I mean, it's going to save city staff time. It's going to save our time and the various entities that are involved because we don't have to look at every single thing on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, we can have some guidelines for how, you know, development should be handled and, and, and those kinds of things. So... Um, yeah. Yep, that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks. Scott? I, generally, I support the idea. I think from a marketing point of view, trying to sell the city when you've got an idea of what you're trying to do with it, whether you're trying to sell the city or any other product, if you've got a plan for what you're trying to do, it just makes your job a lot easier, and it would be helpful for the staff and for, you know, any member of the community to know, you know, kind of what the direction that we're headed. You had mentioned that there's grant opportunities potentially available. Do you have any information about what kind of ap options there are there or what kind of money is truly available there? Because uh, that's what uh, eventually people are going to really focus on is what did this cost us? Yes. Um, Otto Bremer has a section of their foundation that does give money toward planning processes, so we can look into that. Um, there is another program that West Central Initiative has been pushing out to the area that um, it's, it would be more of a, it'd be a little more a creative <clears throat> use of the funding, I guess, um, but it would be like ways to engage and engage the community. That's what it would fund. So it, not, not the full comprehensive plan, but like pieces of it. So, I mean, we can pull together different options for funding. West Central Initiative also used to have, and I don't, 
I don't know if if they currently have it funded because the landscape looks totally different following COVID. Um, but they did have a fund at one point that was dedicated to planning as well. So there are options out there, but that's part of the research we would need to do is what's the right fit for our community and, and what do we want this process to look like? I mean, do we go with the consultant or do we have staff capability? We can do it in house and, and farm out some of it, but th I think we have a lot of options. Jim, did you have a I'm, I'm all for the plan and, and, and I think once we have the plan, we need to revisit that thing at least once a year to make sure we're still on track. And if we're not, are we going in a new direction or are we going back to where where we wanted to go in the first place? It's, it's not something like Justin said, you, you get the plan and it goes on the shelf someplace. And we need to revisit it at least once a year to make sure we're on track. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, Brent? Yeah, I think she answered part of my question. I mean, is this gonna be done in house or we're gonna bring in another consultant again? And I'd like to see us use our own people in order to try to do a majority of this in-house. Number one, it keeps the cost down. And then number two, my concerns with is if I heard Anthony right, I went to a lot of these setups they had when it, and it seems like it was the same people every time I went in. So you had a small minority basically telling us how they wanted the city to be. And I think there needs to be a way to reach a lot more people because I mean it just seemed like there was a when I when I showed up on several of these it was the same people and it's not reaching everybody in the community to be able to get an input on it yeah I think that's a good point Brian we need to this plan needs to reach out and as to Anthony's to have true engagement for the entire community at least the opportunity for the entire community to engage sounds like we're all in agreement to at least have staff uh, come back with us with some options so let's would someone like to make that motion to the council to provide staff with that direction oh. thank you Caroline I'll second that, Justin Caroline. thank you all in favor of that motion say aye aye, aye. aye. post same sign that motion carries thank you Clara there are no additional uh, well, items one additional there. item I'd like staff to look at upgrading the email system to okay. Microsoft Outlook um, my emails keep going into junk and I keep unjunking them and unjunking them um, but obviously for some reason and it's only started to do it and I mean um, business development for Fergus Falls we had a client that basically didn't get emails from us and so and I know city staff have had issues where they've emailed people and they're not getting those emails and I think it's about time we got to the 21st century or the 22nd in this case Hmm. So, so we, we I, just ask I, I, I can make myself look like an idiot often enough without my email going into <laughs> junk. <laughs> so. well, I've certainly had the same. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. And I know there's been some communication. Yep. So I think staff's going to bring something back, what that would yep. look like um, as part of the 2022 budget, I would assume, yeah, right? Your Honor, that is the goal. Um, we're researching those costs now and seeing what that transition might look like. And we had a conversation as department heads on Monday, and I think the consensus of that group is to uh, support going in a new direction as well. So, it, you know, it would be helpful if the council made a motion to that effect, just so we have that. Yeah, I would make the motion. Thank you, Anthony. I will wholeheartedly second that motion. <laughs> second. <laughs> motion and second to direct staff to come back with some options on a new email. So, us all in favor of that motion, say aye. 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 Both yeah. same sign. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That motion carries. Lynn, did you have anything, uh, any announcements? All right, with that, we're adjourned. What was that? Hey,